Hello everyone and welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to touch on a controversial topic about impermanent loss. Now, impermanent loss, it seems like, is something that a lot of liquidity providers really worry about. Now, I actually wrote an article a little while back about why I really don't care about impermanent loss and why you shouldn't either, and I'm basically going to walk through my thoughts in this video. I do want to mention that this isn't going to directly apply for the Uniswap v3 mechanics. Impermanent loss is calculated very differently in Uni v3 because the tighter the price range, the greater impermanent loss the end user faces. So it's not really the same calculation, but some of the principles still do apply. Now before I get started, I do want to cover what impermanent loss is and what it isn't. I think there's a ton of misconceptions about there, so it's important to clarify what I mean when I say impermanent loss. So a lot of people get confused here and they actually conflate the value of your tokens decreasing or declining in your LP position to impermanent loss when that's really not the case. Impermanent loss very specifically only refers to the loss of value you get from providing liquidity versus if you were to just hold those two tokens separately in your wallet and you didn't provide liquidity to them. So for example, if you have two tokens that you're providing liquidity for and they go down by the same percentage each, you're not going to have any impermanent loss, but the actual value of your LP position is going to be a lot lower. So I think that's a really good first misconception to correct here. And that's that impermanent loss really doesn't become significant unless one of the tokens in your LP position has a very drastic price change relative to the other. Now in this theoretical model, I have the price of BTC increasing by 100% and the price of ETH doing nothing, so just remaining steady. So obviously this would be quite uncommon to see, I'll get into correlations in just a bit, uh, but assuming Bitcoin doubles relative to ETH, the amount of impermanent loss you're facing is only 5.72%, which really isn't that significant. Just to work through this a bit more, um, you can see let's say Bitcoin goes up by 200%, so that'd be a 3x move. You can see impermanent loss there is 13.4%, but again, I'll get into correlations in a bit, but we would expect ETH to follow suit and have some type of move there, which again would negate uh, impermanent loss pretty significantly. What's really interesting about this example is you can really see how impermanent loss isn't really tied to the actual change in value of your LP position. So if you have a LP position that's holding Bitcoin and ETH 50-50, and Bitcoin goes up 200% and ETH goes up 100%, the average value of your LP goes up 150%, which is obviously great and something you'd be excited about, but uh, out of that 150%, you'd have about 2% or so of impermanent loss. Now, the next thing I wanna cover is not something that's specific to DeFi or crypto, but is important to understand, and that's the general framework behind modern portfolio theory. Now, modern portfolio theory is one method in finance that helps um, users of this theory try to maximize their yields and minimize risk. So simply put, one of the frameworks and key concepts of modern portfolio theory is that holding a basket of uh, risky assets is better than holding just one risky asset because the standard deviation of your returns will go down the more assets you hold, and therefore the expected future value of your investment goes up. Now, I don't wanna bore you guys too much about the specifics, but I will briefly explain what this graph you're seeing here means and why diversifying your assets is obviously a good thing. So this graph may look confusing, but it's actually quite simple. Um, so let's just assume that each dot um, here is just one asset you could hold. So a dot there is, one dot is Bitcoin, one dot is Ethereum, one dot is Polkadot, uh, one is Matic, etc. Now in this graph here, you can see it's just a two axis graph. You can see we have return on the Y axis and volatility here on the X axis. What this basically means is we can map every asset here based on the return it gets and the volatility it experiences. So in crypto, one simple way to think about this is theoretically Bitcoin should have a lower return but lower volatility, and then ETH would follow that with a bit higher of a return and a bit higher volatility. This generally would continue down the line when we get to more niche coins and smaller market cap coins. Now what's really interesting here is that when we chart this all out on a graph like this, we can actually see where on the line it makes sense to hold these assets and which assets we wanna to hold to have the maximum sharp ratio or risk adjusted return. Now I'm going through all of this basically just to point out that you're pretty much always better off holding multiple risky assets than just putting all of your money in one risky asset. 
Now, why does this relate to impermanent loss? Well, I think a lot of people are calculating impermanent loss when deciding whether to provide liquidity, but they're missing out on the benefits of actually pairing two different assets together and the benefits you get there from just diversifying your holdings and getting a higher expected return. For me personally, I think even without the trading fees, impermanent loss is something I'm okay getting because it's just forcing me to diversify my holdings. A lot of people quibble about whether they want to provide liquidity to say ETHmatic, but what they should really be asking is, would they be holding those two underlying assets in their wallet either way uh, without providing liquidity? Because if you're not going to be holding those underlying assets normally, if you're not providing liquidity, then you really shouldn't even begin to calculate impermanent loss. The reason for this is you actually don't even have impermanent loss if you're not able to compare it to just holding that position normally in your wallet, which again, I really don't think most people are going to be doing if they're not providing liquidity. Now next up, I of course want to talk about how correlation affects impermanent loss. So remember, impermanent loss only occurs when the price ratio between these two assets diverges. So theoretically, if the two assets were perfectly correlated, you would never see impermanent loss. Now this is obviously what occurs in soft pegged assets or hard pegged assets. So for example, DAI and USDC obviously don't have impermanent loss because they're always going to be worth the same amount. What that means is we can look at the correlations in crypto and actually kind of model out how much impermanent loss we're going to face or we could expect to face. What's really unique and fascinating about the crypto markets is they're extremely correlated right now. So for example here, if we just look at the most common pair, probably Bitcoin and ETH, the correlation is 0.81. Now, this is obviously a very high correlation uh, because if the correlation was 1.0, that would mean that these two assets always trade in line with each other. So if Bitcoin were to go up by 10%, Ethereum would follow by going up 10%. Another way to say that is if the correlations were 1.0, there would never be impermanent loss. I will link this website below so you can look at different assets and see how correlated they are to other assets you'd potentially want to pair them with. I think that's a great place to start and a great way to decide if impermanent loss is even really going to be that significant or potentially significant in a specific LP pair. Now, lastly, I do want to show you what the fees look like in Uniswap V2 that are actually meant to compensate you for impermanent loss. So here I am on Zapper and I just went to Uniswap V2 for liquidity positions and we see a few popular ones here, but let's just look at ETH USDT and ETH USDC. So here you can see the fee APR is going to be between 7.7% and 9.7% for an ETH stablecoin uh, pair. Now a couple things to note here. So the first is that, of course, the fees that you earn over one year on Uniswap will outpace this, uh, provided the changes happen over that one year and you can accrue all of those fees. The second thing to note here is that in this example, BTC went up 4x and ETH went up 2x. So are you really going to be troubled by a 5.72% impermanent loss hit? In my opinion, I think it's really just important to be grateful at that point and be happy that you purchased assets that have gone up by so much. You know, if you're a professional fund manager or something, this is something you can get in the weeds on and calculate. But I think for the average person, you should just be happy with the returns you're getting and you should be happy with the fees accrued from Uniswap and then the other staking opportunities you get for holding those LP tokens. Now, the last thing I want to mention is, well, what if the assets that you're holding actually go down in value? So to kind of explore that, I've just put together a DAI ETH pool here that's theoretical. So the value of DAI changes by 0% and ETH goes down by 40% in this example. Now, a couple things here. So the price goes down by 40% of one of your assets, and then your pool also gets impermanent loss of about 3.2%. So obviously you're not really happy about that. It's not great. You have an asset value loss on top of impermanent loss. But let's think about the bright side and go back to what we talked about with modern portfolio theory and efficient investing. So the good thing here is that you're naturally diversified by holding this LP position. You're not fully exposed to ETH or DAI. What that means is, although ETH went down 40%, you're only holding 50% ETH, 50% DAI, so that loss is really only about 20%. Now, when something like this happens, I like to think of impermanent loss as the balancing fee I'm providing to the AMM for automatically balancing my assets and uh, basically giving me diversification or forcing diversification upon me. So really, those are all of the reasons why I don't personally worry about impermanent loss. 
I know a lot of folks do, and I imagine the comment section below is going to be pretty active with people both agreeing with me and disagreeing with me, so I can't wait to hear what you all think there. I also want to remind you to check the DeFi Innovation Discord. There are some great resources there, and there's a lot of folks that are happy to chat with you about DeFi and then help you if you have any unresolved questions. Now, other than that, I want to remind you all to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video.